Welcome back. I'm Dr. Mark Narden, and this is week eight of Digital IC Design at Oregon Tech. This week we will be going through various different types of memory arrays. Uh, the, and two of the main types are SRAM architecture, where we'll be going through the uh, designing of SRAM cells, decoders for SRAMs, uh, column circuitry and multi-ported SRAMs. Uh, and then we'll also be talking about serial access memories. This slide shows how there are many different types of memory arrays. Uh, memory arrays covers a broad uh, variety of uh, different logical functions. Uh, the three main um, high-level uh, categories we can put memory as arrays into are random access memory, serial access me memory, and con content addressable memory. Uh, for the most part, uh, today we'll be going through static SRAM um, and some various different types of shift registers and some amount of read-only memory uh, types. So, uh, so that's mostly what I'll be uh, going through today. Let's start off with a little bit of information about memory array architecture. The first thing to know is that uh, when we talk about arrays, we have in an array, we have a certain number of words. And words is a, a particular concept that we talk about. Um, it's a entry into the array. So uh, that entry will have a certain number of bits in it. And when we're talking about array entries, uh, we say the word words. Um, so when I talk about a, a word in an array, uh, that's a number of bits that are associated with each other. Um, so for example, when we were talking about adders and we had a 16-bit value, if we stored that in that 16-bit value into an array, that would be a word in the array that's 16 bits wide. So typically, when we store words, we store two to the n number of words, uh, because since we're dealing in binary, uh, usually anything that we store, we, we do by the power of two. So um, we'll have like an array that might have 16 words or 32 words or 64, but it'll be a function of two typically. Not always true, but most of the time. Um, and then we usually have a function of two number of bits as well. So it might be a 16 or 32 or uh, 64 wide uh, you know, number of bits in each word. Now, so the, uh, uh, the slide here is kind of showing if the number n is much larger than the number of m, so if the number of words we have in the array is much larger than the number of bits in each word, uh, it can be easier as far as storing the array itself to fold the array by a factor of two to the k power in, uh, into fewer number of rows. So you can see below, uh, for example, if we had something that was only four bits wide, but it was 16 uh, words, um, that are stored in the array, it's much taller and it has a really skinny, tall aspect ratio. Um, that's not always the easiest to actually lay out and it's not always the most efficient in terms of area. Um, so by n being much, much greater than m, typically that's a factor of four or more. Um, so we can kind of fold this over where we take the top eight uh, words and kind of fold it into the bottom eight words, and now we have something that looks like it's more eight by eight array. Um, so this helps, uh, helps to design, gives you a better regularity, and typically it gives us a little bit better density uh, if, we, if we plan for that type of array. So um, just that's not something we'll go into great detail in later, but just be aware that this type of folding can, can be something that can help you as far as uh, 
if your number of words and number of bits are uh, very different from each other. So before we need we go on and talk about how the overall array is arrayed out, uh, we want to know what the basic building block of the array is. So this is the individual uh, bits that we're storing values in. What do those bits look like? Uh, this slide here is showing one possible arrangement for an SRAM cell, which is called a 12T. T stands for transistor, so it's got 12 transistors, SRAM cell. Um, so this, if you use a 12T SRAM cell as your basic building block, um, like I said, it holds one bit of information. And this particular type of cell is very much like a latch. Um, we can read it, we can write it, and it holds the, its information and looks a lot like if you go and look at our latch structure. Um, we have a pass gate. If you look in the lower left um, left hand diagram for the circuit, you'll see that the bit goes to um, input to a pass gate, and then that pass gate uh, has an inverter uh, connected to its output. The inverter feeds back to a tri-state device, which then feeds back to the inverter's input. So you have a back-to-back -back inverter tri-state uh, that will hold a value. When you're writing a value into the, into the bit through the pass gate, the tri-state feedback is turned off, so you don't have to fight the tri-state feedback. When you're storing the value in the bit so the pass gate is closed, the tri-state feedback is turned on, and it will hold a good value there because it's backed back in effective inverters. The output is taken off from on the other side of the inverter uh, that the pass gate drives the middle inverter there. Um, then that output can be taken to a different tri-state that can feed back to the bit value. So, um, but that tri-state will only be uh, turned on when we want to read the value out of the bit. Uh, so we have a write and write bar value that go into the bit and determine whether or not the pass gate and the feedback tri-state are turned on or not. And when we're not writing, um, we can read out the value and the value of bit can be used to drive in a value when you're writing or to read out a value on bit when you're reading. And, you, and in this particular case you can't read and write at the same time. So you either choose on a given cycle or a given phase of the clock, do I want to read the value in a given bit or do I want to write a new value to the, the given bit? So there's also included here uh, a picture of what the layout would look like for this type of cell. And uh, in this particular case, it's 46 by 75 lambda for the unit cell. On the last slide, I went through the design for a 12T SRAM cell. And that's basically the last you're going to hear about that type of cell um, because in the cell size of, of an individual bit accounts for most of the array size of any SRAM array. Um, so you want to reduce the cell size uh, as much as possible even at the expense of adding more complexity and more difficulty in reading and writing the cell. Um, because the decreasing the size of an individual bit allows you to store much, much more information which um, in a given area, which uh, means performance and uh, it, it's just highly desirable. The more memory you can get closest to all of the uh, arithmetic operations you're doing, the better your performance is going to be. So, that brings us to the 6T SRAM cell here. Uh, this is used in most commercial chips uh, because of the size is about as small as you can possibly get for the functionality that you need in order to store a bit of data and be able to read and write into it. And effectively, 
uh, you can see the transistor diagram in the lower right corner. Um, the data is stored in, it says cross-coupled inverters. If you drew this out as inverters, it would basically be back-to-back -back inverters. So you have the output of one inverter feeds to the input of the next inverter, whose output feeds to the, out, to the input of the first inverter. So just back-to-back -back inverters. Uh, if we want to read uh, these back-to-back -back inverters, instead of having a full pass gate trying to drive into it, what we do is we just use NMOS devices because NMOS devices have better drive strength than PMOS devices, and so we can have a smaller NMOS device be uh, a higher drive strength than um, a PMOS device of the same size. So, but if we drive into both sides at the same time, so we drive a bit value into one side of the back-to-back -back inverters and a bit bar value into the other side, then as long as we're pulling the two back-to-back -back inverters different directions, we should be able to override the value that's stored in the bit as long as we design the strengths of the drive devices, the, the two NMOS devices, um, and the back-to-back -back inverters. As long as we size it all correctly, uh, we can make sure that as long as we're driving both sides to different values, we can override the back-to-back -back inverters. So if we're doing a read, what we wind up doing is we initially pre-charge both bit and bit bar. So we, we assign them to the same value, they're both pulled high, and then we, it's similar to a domino uh, cell where we pre-charge it, and then before we raise the word line to turn on the NMOS devices that are attached to the back-to-back -back inverters, we, we turn off the pre-charge devices. So bit and bit bar are now, now floating, now we raise the word value to turn on the NMOS devices that are on either side of the back-to-back -back inverters. One side of those inverters is going to start pulling down. The other side is going to be, be high. And so either one side of the bit or bit bar is going to stay high. The other side is going to start getting pulled down. And so then we can detect which side is being pulled down and we know whether we have a zero or one in our bit. So that's for reading. For writing, what we wind up doing is we drive a data value onto bit and bit bar. So bit will be high or, and bit bar low, or the other way around, bit will be low and bit bar high. Then we raise the word line, and since bit and bit bar are actively being driven, we need to make sure that those are driven by something strong enough that it will override the value inside the data bit and it will write a new value into it. Let's make sure that you fully understand SRAM read and write. I'll go through that in the next two slides um, because that's a very important concept. Uh, so first we'll go through the SRAM read. As I said, first when we're doing a read of the SRAM, there's a value inside of the bit cell of the back to back inverters. And the first thing we want to do is we want to pre-charge both bit lines, bit line bit and bit underscore B. Um, and so if we have both of them pre-charged and then we turn and after we pre-charge them, we turn off the pre-charge device. That's key. We want to make sure that we get it up to a certain value and then we let it float at that value. But just after we turn off the pre-charge, we, then we turn on the word line. So the word line goes from zero to VDD, which will turn on transistors N2 and N4. When those two transistors turn on, one side or the other of the back-to-back -back inverters is low. Uh, so in this particular case, the A value is low. So you can see in the, the graph below, A starts out at zero, 
and a bar is high, when we transition word from low to high, the a value starts going up a little bit because it's trying to discharge the, the bit node, um, but you know some of the charge on bit is starting to couple through and go into a, which raises its value a little bit, but eventually the, the NMOS N1 and N2, since uh, N1 is trying to pull low, it overcomes the, the fact that there's a little bit of charge on bit and then eventually pulls it down fully and pulls bit all the way down from one to zero. So uh, again, only one side, one of the two bit lines will get pulled down by the cell. In this particular case, uh, the bit gets pulled down and the value of A, which was low, kind of gets pulled up a little bit but then you know overcomes the the precharged value a bit and pulls it all the way. Um, so the that explains how to read. One thing that's key here, of course, is for read stability. We want to make sure that the value of a doesn't get flipped because if a got you know you can see a gets pulled up a little bit. If a got pulled up too much the overall bit might flip completely and that that would be a problem. So in order to make sure that doesn't happen, one of the key things is we need the value of N1, so the, the size of the N1 transistor, we want to be greater than the size of the N2 transistor. You can see that if there was a lot of capacitance on bit and if the N2 transistor was bigger than N1, it would allow too much of the charge to, to go from bit to A before N could continue to pull it down. Whereas if we limit how much charge can go through the N2 transistor such that it can't pull up the A value faster than N1 can keep pulling it down, um, that's one way to get your read stability. So key lesson here, uh, for read stability, we want N1 to be greater than N2 by enough. Uh, what much, much greater than means could be a factor of two, could be more than that, um, could be less than that, depending on the process technology and how much capacitance there is on the bit line. And um, so it's something that you, you have to study and make sure you, you do enough um, work on to make sure that for your particular usage, N1 is much, much greater than N2, uh, but that is a little bit debatable. Here we can see what we want to happen during a write into the SRAM uh, bit cell. So in this particular case, as I mentioned before, what we do instead of in the read case, we precharge bit and bit bar, but then we let them float at the precharged value, and then we turn down the word line. In this case, what we want to do is we want to actually drive bit and bit bar to opposite values and actively drive them. So we, if we want to write a one into the array, we drive bit to one and bit bar to zero and then we turn on the word line. So let's see what happens in this case when we do that. So if we had a value in, the, in this bit, bit cell, the value of a is zero to start with, and of course then a bar is a one, what we, but we want to write a value of one into the bit cell instead. So we drive bit to one and bit bar to zero, then we turn on the word line. The bit, bit lines, as they're actively driven to bit to one and bit bar to zero, we want them to be able to override the value in the cell to create a new value. So in this particular case, we want to write the value of a to a zero, or no, a to a one from a zero, and a bar to a zero from a one. What really happens if we look in the lower right corner we can see how the transitions actually happen. So we start out with 
uh, a is a zero, a bar is a one, and our word transitions from zero to one. You can see that similar to last time, the value of a starts going up a little bit, but it's not going up too rapidly. But the value of a bar, when bit a bar starts at a one and bit bar is trying to pull it to zero. So the value of a bar winds up getting pulled down and because a bar gets pulled down there's now the cross coupled inverters uh, the feedback inverter that's driving P1 and N1 which are driving the A value um, its input of that inverter has now gotten pulled low and so that actually helps pull up the value of A along with the the N2 node where bit is trying to pull up A, the, the cross-coupled inverter actually tries to pull up A as well. Uh, so what winds up happening here is we need to be able to write into the bit cell and we must be able to overpower the feedback inverter and the way that we do that is we make sure that they have written here N2 is much much greater than N1 by the same token N4 has to be much greater than P2 so as long as whichever side is trying to write the zero into the back-to-back -back inverters the NMOS device writing a zero into the cell has to be stronger than the PMOS device that's fighting it and so that's the way you wind up writing a zero into the side that has the zero going into it and then the feedback inverter on the other side um, gets flipped and writes the opposite value that helps out the NMOS on the other side because keep in mind the side that's trying to drive a one through an NMOS doesn't do a very good job at it or doesn't do as good a job as the side that is writing a zero through an NMOS. So the zero through the NMOS is what writes the cell and then the other side just gets that value after it gets written into the the one side. So just re to reiterate what uh, the previous two slides on reading and writing of an SRAM mean as far as the bit cell sizing goes and the the transistor sizing inside the the inverters or inside the 6T transit uh, cell uh, we want to make sure that the bit lines when so when the bit lines are high so when we precharge or when we're driving a bit line high we don't want that to be able to overpower the inverters during reads but a bit line pulled low must be able to write a new value into the cell and so that's why when we're reading that's one of the reasons why we pull both bit lines high instead of let's say pulling both bit lines low or to some other value if we pull them both high uh, we can make sure to size the transistors inside the cell such that the high value won't overpower the internal back-to-back -back inverters during reads but driving one side of the bit line low will be able to write into the cell. So you can see here um, the way the cell is constructed, the back-to-back -back inverters that are driving A and A bar inside the cell, those um, NMOS devices are strong, but the PMOS devices in the back-to-back -back inverters are weak, and then we make the devices, the NMOS kind of pass devices that are connected to the word line, we make those kind of intermediate uh, medium strong um, so that they're strong enough to overcome the weak PMOS but they're not strong enough to overcome the strong internal back-to-back -back inverters. So that's a key thing about the sizing of the various different inverters. Make sure you remember that particular detail in your sizing of your SRAM cell inverters or SRAM cell transistors for the 6T cell. 
So this uh, slide here is showing how we would create a, a column of SRAM bit cells in order to do reads and writes from a column. So by column, what I'm talking about is, uh, so if we look at the read there, we have a 6T cell uh, that we want to do a read from. And this is a particular bit of a particular word. So for example, let's say this is bit zero of word zero, and we have an array that's composed of an eight words um, that are being stored in the array, and each word, let's say, has eight bits in it. So if this is bit zero of word zero, where that dot, dot, dot is that says more cells above the, the word Q1, uh, that's where we would have bit zero of word one, bit zero of word two, bit zero of word three. We basically have a row, every row is going to be a word, bits zero through seven, and each column is a particular column of bit zero, is one column for for each of eight different words. Uh, next to that, the next column would be bit one of each word of each eight words. The next column would be bit two of each word of eight words, etc. So when we want to read out a particular word, we activate the word line that hits every single bit in the same row. And so all bits of a given word are in a row like I mentioned. So, um, so what we have at the top of the column is, like I said, the bit lines, bit and bit bar, need to be, if we're doing a read, they need to be pre-charged to a given value. So at the top of the column, we have PMOS pre-charged transistors that are clocked by a phi2 clock name, and it's actually clocked here by phi2 bar, so the inverse of phi2. So down below you can see where the timing diagram is for if we have um, a two-phase clock. So we have phi1 and we have phi2. So if we're doing a read, the read has to be done when the pre-charge is off. So pre-charge would be off for PMOS when phi2 bar is high, which means phi2 is low. So we're going to do our pre-charge. Um, when the clock comes in and goes high, phi2 bar is low, so we're pre-charging when phi2 is high. And then when phi2 is low, the PMOS pre-charge devices turn off, we can have our word line come in and turn high, which is the word Q1, the blue signal there. When that goes high, then one side or the other of either bit or bit bar is going to discharge, depending on the value that's in the SRAM cell. Um, so that value is gonna go, one, one side is gonna go low, and then at there's two um, inverters at the end of the bit line that will take the signal that's coming out of the bit line and invert it and we get an out B and an out and one of those will be high one of those will be low and then we're gonna wind up capturing those in a latch somewhere at, at outside of where those inverters are. So the inverter value will go into a latch and we'll make sure to clock that with maybe the falling edge of phi one, for example, or possibly the rising edge of phi two. Uh, so either way, we need to capture the value coming out of the read um, after the inverters. For an SRAM write, I don't have the uh, timing diagram uh, below, but in effect, it's similar to a read uh, with the exception that so initially we'll pre-charge both bit lines and then after we have them pre-charged 
we turn off the precharge value. Uh, we make sure that the value of data underscore S1, that's actually the inverted data, because if we have, let's say, a data value of S1 as a 1, and we come in and we turn on or, or put the value of write Q1 to a 1, um, if data is a 1 and write Q1 is a 1, the bit value is going to be pulled down. The bit bar value is going to stay high. And then when we turn on the word Q1, the bit side, which is being pulled low, is going to flip the A value and pull it low. And that's going to cause the back-to-back -back inverter um, to, to flip uh, on the, the A side and the A bar side internal to the, uh, to the bit is going to go to a one. And so then everything's consistent inside the bit cell. And again, keep in mind that the critical side of a write is whichever side is trying to pull to zero is gonna be pulled to zero. The side that's trying to be a one um, isn't able to overwrite a zero if it's inside the, uh, the bit cell until the other side flips the bit cell and then you get the help of the internal inverter as well as the external bit line pulling the value up to one. Um, so, um, so this is just showing how at the bottom of the column you have your write circuitry uh, and those will kind of be sharing space with the, the read values of, of those read inverters shown on the left hand side. So at the top of the column you have your bit line conditioning, at the bottom of the column you have kind of your read and write um, circuitry for the array.